Welcome! Today we are going to take a look at the cool Canvas Vector Library Paper.js. As an introduction, I would be hard pressed to explain it better than its website, so I'll paraphrase a few quotes for you. Paper.js is an open source vector graphics scripting framework that runs on top of the HTML5 canvas. Paper.js is not simply a wrapper around the canvas. It's a scene graph document object model for vector graphics. This means you can work with nested layers, groups, paths, compound paths, rasters, symbols, etc. It also includes PaperScript, a simple extension of JavaScript, allowing the scoped execution of scripts without polluting the global scope. The execution of multiple scripts per page in their separate sandbox scopes, while sharing the library code and adding support for operator overloading to any object. To take Paper.js for a spin, we are going to build an animated tag tree logo using Paper.js. At the end of the screencast, we will end up with exactly what you see here. We will also make sure that it renders correctly according to the size of the window, which is a huge benefit of working with vectors. Let's get started by creating a simple project that pulls in Paper.js. We install Paper using Bower. I'm creating an index.html file that will contain our canvas. I've pre-coded this page. It's very simple, a standard HTML file referencing Paper.js. And it has a canvas. The only interesting part is the reference to tagtree.js. As you can see it has two interesting attributes. The type attribute is PaperScript. That's because Paper extends JavaScript to allow you to take some shortcuts, specifically with operators. So for example, it will allow you to multiply a size object by 3. The canvas attribute is a reference to the ID of the canvas the script should target. We also create a tag tree.js file, which the HTML expects to be there. We're going to do all the rest of the work in this file. One last thing before we get down and dirty with paper. We need to host this so that we can hit it up in the browser. I usually use the built-in Python web server module for simple projects like this, and Yeoman with Grunt for more complex stuff. We'll start with something simple. We're going to code up a rectangle, which is basically a collection of point and size objects, which is used by a specialized path object, which knows how to use the config to render a rectangle to the canvas. We also want to fill the path with this particular color. We want a white border and a wide stroke around the path. And we've got a rectangle. Now let's rotate that path by 45 degrees so that it looks like the logo in the final product. We started with the simplest solution first, which was to hard code all our locations and sizes. But we would want this logo to scale according to the size of the canvas. That's what vector drawings are all about. To do that, we need to introduce some variables at the top here. Don't worry about global variables, because Paper compiles PaperScript to be fully isolated. We pull out the canvas size first. From there, we work out which is the smallest, between the width and the height. That's what we're going to use for the maximum size we can draw the rectangle in. In this animation, the white rectangle is the size of the canvas. The max size variable corresponds to the max length of a side in the square drawing area we can target with a logo. We also pull out the center of the canvas into a variable. Now we get to calculate our relative size using the max size variable. What we're basically saying here is that we want the rectangle to have the width and height of 90% the maximum drawable area. We also want to position the rectangle relative to the canvas dimensions and we want to position it in the center. To do this, we calculate the top left position of the rectangle from the center of the canvas by subtracting half the height and half the width. This animation shows how we calculate the top left position of the badge rectangle. Now it's just a matter of plugging in these values to the rectangle configuration. 
It's a bit big for our view, but I did that on purpose. I wanted to illustrate the power of working with percentages, because when I change it to 60% now, it scales nicely. The stroke is still hard coded, so let's make that relative. Hmm, that looks cool. We need to do a bit of cleanup here. This code needs a bit of structure because we're going to add a lot more soon. Let's introduce a bit of OOP here. So we start by defining the badge function. Now we flesh out its prototype, setting the function as its constructor. We'll move the drawing code to its draw function. So we copy all the stuff directly into it. Let's return the badge object from the draw function. It lends itself to a more fluent interface, as you'll see a bit later on. Now we can construct this badge object and call the draw function on it. Now we're going to build up the tree in the logo. We're taking the same approach as we did with the badge. We're going to hard code the crap out of it, then refactor afterwards. We start by creating a rectangle for the bottom right branch. I chose to draw the branches from the left to right and then rotating from its left point. That's why I'm using a negative angle here. As you can see, this doesn't look right. The branch is too close to the edge of the badge. That's because it's rotating the branch from its center, as is the default with paper. Luckily, we can specify a rotation point for the path. So we calculate the left part of the branch, taking care to specify the vertical center. That looks promising. Let's test this code to see if we can use it for the other branches as well. We duplicate it and change the angle so that we can render a branch on the left. It's looking like we can reuse this code for all the branches, but we need to make it relative as we did with the badge. We want to render the branch in the center of the badge, so it makes sense to make the badge's path available to the code on the outside. So let's just set it on the object so that it can be retrieved externally. We can use the badge path to calculate the origin for our branch. Horizontally we want it at the center of the canvas, as our rectangle is also positioned in the center. Vertically, we start from the top of the rectangle and use the max size to calculate the relative ratio that positions the branch. We could have opted to use the rectangle size too, but I used the max size variable we pulled out already at the top of the script. In this animation, you can see how we get to the origin point for the branch. Let's use this origin for both of the branches. Nice, we've got relative positioning hooked up. We do the same for the branch size. Whoops, that's a bit big. Let's scale it down a bit. That's much better. As we did with the badge, we want to refactor this code and create a branch object which we can reuse for all the branches. So we do this using the combination constructor prototype pattern again. This time I want some arguments available to the constructor. On our object, we want a draw function exactly like the badge object earlier. Okay, let's start pulling out some variables from the args, which we'll use in the object later on. We want a relative size, a relative origin, a position, right, left, or center. We also calculate some variables we're going to use later on. For now, we just hard code the angle. Let's take what we've learned earlier and flesh out the draw function. We calculate the origin. 
targeting the horizontal center and a relative vertical value based from the top of the badge by utilizing our relative origin argument against the max size value. We construct our rectangle using this origin and a relative width we get by multiplying the relative size parameter with a max size variable. We construct a path from the rectangle config. We rotate the path from the middle of the left edge and set its color to white. Now we can comment out this old code for a moment and use our new object to draw a branch. We plug in the same values as we used earlier because all the calcs are still the same. That looks promising. We hard coded the angle earlier. To make this dynamic, we call a calculate angle function, which we add onto the object. We want to support three angles, so we create a simple object containing the rotation for each angle. Then we just return the correct value based on the position parameter. Let's take this for a spin on our existing branch. Looks good. Now it's really easy to create the left branch as well. Before we start with the other branches, I'd like to see what it looks like when we introduce the trunk, just to make sure that everything is lined up correctly. We use the center position for this. I'm just plugging in some garbage numbers for now. Looks promising, but let's just fix the size and origin numbers. Now it's looking perfect. I'll just copy in the rest of the branches. Great! As you can see here in the code I copied in, the top branches have a color parameter, but we don't cater for that yet. Let's fix that. That's looking perfect. And it even resizes according to the canvas size. We've got a static logo drawn on the canvas, but we want it to rotate. We hook into the onframe event in paper by providing an onframe function. In here we call the rotate function on the badge, which we need to provide now. We create the rotate function and rotate the path by 5 degrees for now, just to test that everything is hooked up correctly. Looks okay, but we wanted to alternate between rotating and idle states. To facilitate the different rotation states for the badge, we're going to introduce a really simple state machine which we specify in the constructor function. We start with the idle state. We wanted to stay in the idle state for 150 frames and we wanted to go to the twirling state after it's done. The twirling state is a bit different. We want it to be in the state until it's completed rotating 360 degrees. We want it to go to the idle state once it's done, and we want it to rotate 5 degrees per frame. We've got one last thing to do in the constructor function. We set the default state to idle. We need to change the rotation function to work off the state machine we set up. We want to keep track of the number of frames we've spent on a state, so we ensure that the state has a frame count defaulting it to zero. Now we increment the frame count for this state. We check whether we should rotate the badge in this state by seeing if it's got an increment variable. If it does, we rotate the badge by the increment value. In the same way we stored the frame count on the state, we also want to keep track of how far we've rotated it. So we make sure that the state has a rotation value, defaulting it to zero. We increment the rotation value on the state, so that we can keep track of it. We also want to know when to exit a certain state, so we call a function we'll code up now. Let's call it isLastFrameForCurrentState. If this function returns true, 
we reset the frame count and rotation for this state and transition the state machine to the next state by setting the current state on the badge to the target state of the current state. Let's flesh out the function that figures out whether we should transition to the next state. We've got two ways to check this, either the number of frames we've been in a state, as is the case with the idle state, or the rotation that has been applied in total while in a state, as is the case with the twirling state. Great, as you can see it alternates between the two different states quite nicely. The transition between idle and twirling is a bit jerky though, so we're going to utilize the state machine to remedy this. I've copied in my final config for the state machine. As you can see, it now has four states. In addition to the idle and twirling states, it now has easing in and easing out states. When it transitions from idle, it will rotate for 20 degrees, one degree per frame, before it starts rotating at five degrees per frame in the twirling state. When it transitions from twirling to idle, it will rotate for 20 degrees, one degree per frame again. Nice! The easing made the animation look a hundred times better in my opinion, but that's just me. And that's it for this screencast on Paper.js. After playing around with paper, my key takeaway was that it's necessary to utilize OOP constructs to keep the code clean and flexible. Until next time,